Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. In Hillsborough County in Florida, I got off work at around 2 a.m. and was going home. I took a left on Hopewell Road off Highway 39, made the left turn on the road. As I was driving less than a minute, a car heading toward me was beating and flashing their high beam. I didn't know if it was teens playing around or somebody that had too much to drink, so I blew it off. As I was coming to the curb, there is a fence maybe four to five feet tall. As I was going around the curve, my headlights caught something that looked to be three to four feet taller than the fence. It looked at me with these red eyes. I felt numb and frightened. I always think about the other person that was driving that night. What did they see? The area has been developed since then. The trees are almost gone. It was around 2 to 3 a.m. On to the next one. My girlfriend and I decided to go to Alexander Springs camping for the weekend. We were living in Ormond Beach, Florida, approximately one hour from Alexander Springs. This was a spur-of-the-moment idea that Friday afternoon. We rushed around to pack our four-man tent, lawn chairs, coolers, and get groceries for the weekend and a case of oysters. We headed for the springs and were in a hurry to get there with plenty of daylight so we could set up our tent. By the time we got our tent set up, it was turning to dusk. We realized we had forgotten to buy firewood, so we went into town to purchase a load of wood that would fill the trunk of our car. By the time we got back, it was dark. The campground had some lighting for safety purposes. I guess in case one had to walk to the bathroom and shower facilities, we had started a fire and we also began cooking steaks on the grill and eating oysters and other snacks. We had plenty of food to last the weekend packed in our cooler. We ate our food, cooked on the grill, then played cards till about 3 a.m. We decided to quit and go to sleep so we could get up early to check out the site. My girlfriend fell asleep right away and I laid there for about half an hour with a headache and couldn't go to sleep. I was listening to what sounded for sure like raccoons chattering around our site. I figured they'd be looking for crumbs. Suddenly, the noise of the raccoons stopped and everything went silent and I smelled what seemed to be the scent of a skunk. I thought it was strange because I had been living in Florida for 20 years and had never smelled a skunk. I thought there were no skunks in Florida. I sat up thinking I would go outside the tent and see what was going on. When I looked to my right, I saw a shadow cast on the tent from the lighting in the campground, what looked to be a man, and my first thought was, surely no other campers would take our food in the night. It made a noise that I questioned was a bear, but it didn't sound like any bear noise I'd ever heard, and I'm originally from Upper Michigan, near the Great Lakes, a very remote area with lots of bears, and had seen and heard many in my life. Then I got to thinking, this figure was standing up and not on all fours, and was so tall, I thought it couldn't have been a man stealing our food, there were not many campers on the ground that night either. At first, I was approaching the door of the tent to go out and investigate when I heard the strange noise again. It sounded like a grunt noise. I did not feel this was a bear, but couldn't imagine what it was. I was somewhat frozen in fear for a minute. Then I started talking to my girlfriend, trying to wake her up, and she was scared. We only had one small flashlight and no weapons as we sat there, stating we wish we had a gun, so I did not go outside of the tent. 
but we could not go to sleep that night. The next morning, at early daylight, we came out of the tent to find a mess. Our coolers had been ransacked, most of the food gone. I attributed this to raccoons, but realized they were not there long enough to make such a mess, I didn't think. So we just laughed about most of the day and joked about Bigfoot, but never did we actually think that was what may have been outside of our tent and eating our food. We had to go into town for more groceries that day. Later that night, things felt strange, and it had been raining lightly all day to a heavier rain by nighttime. We sat in the tent, playing cards, talking about this thing I saw outside the tent. We decided to get out quick, packed our stuff up, and even left the tent. At work a couple of days later, I asked a friend at work who had been there the week before camping if she had seen any bears there, and she said, yeah. But when I told her what I saw, she said it sounded too weird. It took a few days before I unpacked the car and then realized we had left behind the tent. I called the ranger at Alexander Springs and told them we had left our tent. They stated they wondered what had happened to us. We told them to keep the tent or dispose it. They said they could store it for us till we came back again. We told them we didn't think we would be back anytime soon and go ahead and do whatever they wanted with it. We did not tell them of our experience, and I never told anyone else because I thought they would think I was crazy. When I came across Bigfoot Report online, I was hesitant to report, but my girlfriend has encouraged me too. I know that what we saw was not a bear. It was way too big to be a man or even a tall man. All animals stopped making any sounds and I smelt a skunk. Also, there was breaking of branches and movement. There was a lot of chaotic noises that sounded like a large animal ransacking our campsite. I read online about a sighting in the Ocala National Forest. I also had an experience in a remote area of Chiefland, Florida in Levy County. One summer, I was on a 10-acre parcel way off a country road in a desolate area with only two other homes on the road. I was living in a bus that had been turned into an RV. I was staying out there putting up a mobile home. I was purchasing the land from a friend and we were building a septic system and we had no power to the property at this time. The mobile home was set up at the back of the property near the woods and the bus was behind the mobile home closer to the woods. I was using a small generator for power at the time. I had awakened before dawn at about 4 a.m. and was trying to make a pot of coffee with my generator. I sat there looking out into the woods and saw several pair of red eyes, some far away and some very close to the bus. At first, I thought critters in the night. Then I began to wonder how I could see their red eyes as dark as it was and they were high enough up that they were as high as the windows on the bus. I thought there were critters in the trees, but then I questioned how I could see these red eyes when I've only seen the red eyes in animals due to a reflection. These eyes also seemed bigger than a normal animal's eyes, which made me very curious. I just sat there amazed while everyone else was sleeping. I had two small children with me also and didn't want to wake them and scare them. I don't know what kind of eyes these were, but I'd always thought them to be very questionable. When the sun rose that morning, I rushed down to my friend's stand at the flea market that was helping me with the property. I told him he could have everything. Just get me a 32-foot U-Haul to get my family and furniture out of there. I'm going back to Daytona Beach the city life. I don't know what I saw that early morning before daylight, but to this very day, I have always wondered how I could see the red eyes on those animals without a light reflection and how they could be as high up as the windows of the bus. It was very dark, but there was some lighting in the campground. It was a warm, clear night, approximately 3 a.m. There were many lakes, deep forests, and springs, there was much wildlife. The forest is very dense and has a large area along State Road 40 that is desolate.
On to the next one. Carla and I were proud owners of beautiful ranch land in Driggs, Idaho for nearly 15 years. We were steady in high school and then rekindled that relationship after going through divorces around the same time. When we were young, we often discussed how we wanted to get married and move to a large piece of land with a mountainous backdrop. About six months later, after we got back together, Carla came across a stunning property offered at a very reasonable price. She was a realtor, so she had the advantage of seeing lots of places before they went on the market. I was out of a job at the time, so I was a bit nervous about committing to a new home, but it was just too good of a deal to pass up. That was back in 1975, so it wasn't until we had lived at the ranch for almost two years that we began to witness the phenomenon. We had an extensive backyard surrounded by wood. Since we didn't yet own any horses, we decided not to install a fence. That allowed a variety of wildlife to pass through the property more easily. Well, I think it's safe to say our expectations were surpassed beyond our wildest imagination. I want to mention that I never even knew anyone else in the area who claimed to see a Sasquatch. Carla has a vague memory from her childhood of a teacher telling the class he saw one, but she's not sure that he wasn't just kidding around. It's not as though we were in the location where there were many legends of Bigfoot, at least not to my knowledge, so that only made our first sighting that much more surprising. Carla and I had a morning ritual where we drink our coffee on the second story balcony connected to our bedroom. It was spacious and provided the perfect view of the backyard. It wasn't unusual for us to watch a herd of deer casually move through the area, checking the ground for anything edible. In December of 77, Carla and I enjoyed our morning routine, sipping our java and observing the deer, when something from the northwest seemed to catch their attention. Deer do this thing where they raise their tails when they sense danger is near. It's a strategy to warn the rest of the herd that they need to be on high alert. We all know that deer are skittish creatures, but they almost always seem to feel quite comfortable in our yard. It was a very wide open space with only a few trees scattered about, so they must have thought they had plenty of room to detect lurking predators. On the rare occasions where they would get spooked, they usually returned to grazing a few moments later after concluding that the coast was clear. Well, this time, it was a different story. I stood from my seat as I watched this oddly shaped thing burst out of the wood. At first, it ran on two legs, but it shifted to all fours when the deer took off in the opposite direction. I could not believe how fast this thing was. It caught up to the slowest deer with ease even with the modest layer of snow. The herbivore looked like it got hit by a semi-truck, instantly going limp afterward. What on God's green earth is that? Carla gasped, now standing shoulder to shoulder with me. I've no idea, I said, stunned as ever. I might have immediately suspected it was a Sasquatch, had I known that they move around on all fours. But this creature didn't move like an ape when it was in that position. It looked far more like a dog or maybe even a cheetah because of its outstanding agility. This thing was as athletic as life form comes, there's no question. The other deer were already out of sight before I even started to consider additional traits of this peculiar animal. I don't have the best long-distance vision, so my wife walked inside quickly to fetch a pair of binoculars from the bedside drawer. We often used them when large birds of prey would come around, but we never left them outside due to the changing elements. Carla handed the binoculars to me to be the first to take an up-close look. I think she was a bit hesitant to take a closer look because she was already creeped out by the animal. I nearly lost grip of the instrument once I lifted it to my eyes. How could a man's face be on the body of a bear? 
I don't want to overstate the similarities to a human, but the face was much more human-like than anything else. Nothing about the situation made even the slightest bit of sense. Aside from the facial features, the rest of it was covered with very unkempt hair. I suppose you would refer to that sort of thing as dreadlocks? I'm confident that the creature would have given off a foul stink had we been closer. It could have been partially due to the sun's glare, but it appeared there was a combination of brown and blondish hair from top to bottom. We watched the creature dive into the belly of the deer, much like you might see from a lion or a bear, after it captures its prey. I thought the deer was dead from the previous impact, but it then woke up and lifted its head in the air. It began screaming after it realized it was getting eaten alive. The predator then slammed its fist on the deer's head, and it was out like a light. That time, I knew it had to be dead. I'm not sure anything aside from maybe an elephant would be able to survive a blow like that. The massive creature spent a few minutes eating before it stood up on two feet, threw its kill over its shoulder, and began walking back toward the wood in a way that was so darn human-like. I found it fascinating how quickly the creature fluctuated between human-like and animalistic behavior. There was something so very odd about the way it did that. I guess it was because it was so unlike anything else I had ever laid eyes upon. Before we knew it, the bipedal creature had disappeared back into the woods, and my wife and I were left almost speechless. We had to go inside before either of us could get another word out. I remember how we sat on the edge of our bed for God knows how long. Although we were utterly amazed and maybe even a little excited, something about the sighting got under our skin. I'm not sure if it had to do with being close to an apex predator or strictly due to the revelation that something like that exists. It's hard to say. It was probably only because we felt protected on the second-story floor balcony that we weren't too frightened during that initial sighting. We carried on with our usual routine the following day, but didn't see anything. The deer didn't come through either, and we wondered whether it was because of what happened 24 hours earlier. However, the next day after that, the deer returned, seemingly oblivious to the recent slaughter. It couldn't have been more than five minutes before we noticed not one, but two bipedal creatures protruding from the woods at the same spot as the last one. Somehow, we saw the danger before the herd of deer. The two bipedal creatures began a slow and steady approach when suddenly others emerged from the forest behind them. There were four more of them. A couple of them were considerably smaller than the others, leading me to think they must be juvenile. Perhaps the adults had brought the young ones out there to teach them to hunt. It wasn't too long before the deer noticed and took off, prompting all five of the predators to get down on all fours and chase after them. As if it wasn't impressive enough, the other day, watching the group do their thing was incredible. They seemed to be so in sync with one another, much like what you would see from a pack of orcas during a hunt. Four out of five predators caught a deer, but I believe the smallest of the bunch came up empty-handed. Fortunately for the young one, the others were willing to share their meat. I couldn't believe that this buffet was happening right in front of us. Every one of the odd-looking creatures ate until they were stuffed. I assumed they must have been aware of our presence since Carla and I were right there in the open but I suppose they thought there was a comfortable distance dividing us. This same routine carried on over the next few weeks, usually with a day or two in between sightings. It proved how dim-witted the deer are. It was almost as if they were content watching their numbers dwindled. For at least a couple of weeks, the clan of predators didn't seem to mind us whatsoever. But then there was one day when that seemed to change. One morning, the deer came much closer to the house. They'd often change up the area where they preferred to graze, 
but this was perhaps the closest we'd ever seen them come to the house, at least to linger. That made me a bit nervous right from the get-go, and I remember contemplating whether we should stay inside that day. I even went as far as to consider leaving the house for the morning. On the other hand, I saw it as a new opportunity to see these creatures so up close and personal. What if it all continued to go as smoothly as before? Interestingly, I have no idea why we had those trepid feelings. Before that day, there wasn't a single incident that suggested we were putting ourselves at risk. I'm convinced there was some instinctual interweaving with that, but there's no way to be sure. We observed vast land in our usual spot on the second floor balcony. By that point, both Carla and I had a pair of binoculars, so we scanned the forest edge while sipping our java. Another strange thing is how neither of us spotted the clan of predators until they were close to the house. The deer didn't either. The nearest Sasquatch must have been within 15 feet of the herd before even one of them noticed. It put its tail in the air and took off, as did the other deer, but it was too late. Carl and I watched the brutal scene of a doe getting swung against one of our trees repeatedly. There was a lot of blood. It almost hurt to watch, but felt so impossible to turn away from the amazement. The strength of these predators is truly something else. It's beyond my comprehension. When they seemed to be finished up the meal, one of the more giant beasts stood and made eye contact with me. I wouldn't say it looked like an angry stare, but more like a blank stare. It's hard to tell. If you've ever seen one of these things up close, you might know what I mean by saying it's hard to read their expression. The beast continued to stare at me until I began to feel very uncomfortable. It might have been my imagination, but something warned me not to look away. What if the beast saw it as a sign of disrespect? What's it doing? Carla whispered, apparently also worried by the idea of looking away. I don't have the slightest idea, I whispered back, perhaps too quiet for my wife to hear. The massive predator stepped around its kill and took a few bipedal steps toward the balcony. Its approach didn't feel aggressive either. It seemed more like maybe it wanted to get a closer look at us. But then, the horror happened. That thing's mouth opened so gosh darn wide that it looked like its lower jaw was about to touch the ground. It was the freakiest looking thing I've ever seen. It then unleashed a deafening noise that was unlike anything else I've ever heard. I get why so many people say they sound like a screaming woman, but it almost sounded like something mechanical or electronic was going on there. I'm not saying that's the case, but something about the frequency of the pitch made me feel that way. The other predators began to stand, giving the impression that they were about to follow the noisy one's lead. My wife and I rushed inside our bedroom and closed the door behind us. Although the noise wasn't as bad, it was still painful on our ears. Without us communicating, we hurried to one of our guest bedrooms across the hall, which helped a bit but still it was terrible. It was staggering how powerful that sound was and how long it lasted. It was so disorienting and neither of us could even tell whether the other beasts had joined in. We sat on the edge of the guest's bed covering our ears until the noise finally stopped. It couldn't have gone on for all that long, but it's just that every moment of it was torment. It was so strong that I wouldn't be surprised to find out that people have gone deaf after getting blasted by that noise at close range. That's now one of the scariest things I can imagine. My wife agrees. Although the awful noise had ceased, we remained in that bedroom with the door locked for the next while. We had no way of knowing whether the clan would break their way into our home or God knows what. I wanted to have as much reason as possible to hope that they had returned to the wood. Eventually, I had Carla stay put while I went to take a gander through one of the other windows. The Sasquatch were no longer in sight, 
and neither were the carcasses of their prey. I've since speculated whether that guttural roar was intended to intimidate us while they took their meat to a secret location. By prompting Carla and me to seek cover, they could take off without complications. It's a bit humorous to imagine that those creatures thought we might have followed them to their hideout to steal their meat. We never even thought of that possibility until we spoke to an expert via Skype, and he explained why that was most likely the reason for the awful noise. I guess it makes sense. After all, most predators have strategies to warn competitors not to get close. It's just funny to think that something like that could ever see people like us or any human as competition. That's just downright ridiculous in my opinion. I can talk about all that Sasquatch stuff with these now, but we went on vacation right after the incident and didn't return for a few months. We wanted to wait for spring to come around so that there was a chance the Sasquatch clan moved on. Although we believed them to be migratory creatures, we've never seen them in our yard since, and we suspect it has to do with the lack of the deer population. Anywho, don't be too surprised if you ever see these things on your property, especially if you live in a secluded location. The best advice I can give is to keep your composure, and they'll most likely leave you alone. Although these beasts look scary, I don't believe they crave human flesh. I'm a firm believer that they've only been thinking they were protecting themselves and their families when they have injured or killed people. As long as you keep a safe distance, you should be fine. I'll admit that I would be terrified to see what happened had I pointed a gun at the clan that came through our property. On to the next one. I'm a wildlife biologist. When people find this out, they always think I led a life of outdoor adventure, which is actually rarely the case. I probably spend more time indoors in an office writing up reports and doing surveys than I do outdoors, especially in the winter. But there was one time that I bet few can match for excitement, or maybe I should call it adventure, or maybe there are better words for that day, such as disbelief, wonder, and terror. And believe me, none of my scientific colleagues know this story. Well, with one exception, a fellow employee who is sworn to secrecy. I know she'll keep her pledge since she saw the same thing once. It was early winter and I was out in the forest trying to do a wolf count. This happened in the Yellowstone Park area, not far from the Lamar Valley, where packs of wolves tend to hang out. I worked for a state agency, not the park, but I can't say any more about that. It would be too easy to figure out who I am, as I still work there. I carried a dart gun with tranquilizer darts because there was a lone wolf, a female, that I wanted to radio call her. Normally, one would never do this kind of work alone, but there just wasn't anyone else available to go out with me. I really wanted to be able to call her this particular wolf if I happened to come across her, which was unlikely, but I wanted to be ready just in case. Winter is a good time to observe wildlife in the Yellowstone area, as the grizzly bears are hibernating and not a problem. Otherwise, one has to be really cautious. But in winter, about all you have to worry about are the bison, and they aren't much of a worry, really, as they stick together and you can easily avoid the herd. So, I was creeping along in the cover of the trees on the edge of a valley, stopping all the time to use my binoculars and scout around. A few times, I saw movement down by the river, but it always turned out to be coyotes. I came across a beautiful herd of bison in the distance, but nothing really unusual. It was a cold, crisp day with sunny blue skies, perfect weather for what I was doing and I was really enjoying myself. I really liked my job when I wasn't stuck indoors. I slowly snowshoed along the small valley I was in, staying at the edge of the trees, 
stopping a lot to scope things out, looking for wolves. The snow was only a foot or so deep, so the going was easy. I felt like a mountain man, as I had the whole place to myself. Well, me and the animals. I carried a day pack with my lunch and a thermos of hot tea with lots of sugar for energy. And I finally decided it was time to sit down on a rock and enjoy a bite to eat. I was on a rise, and a breeze had picked up and was cooling things down. But it was still pretty nice if you sat in the direct sun. But even though it was only about 1 p.m., I knew I only had another couple of hours before I needed to head back, as the sun set by five and I was a good hour or so in. I finished my sandwich and sipped some hot tea from my thermos when I noticed what looked like a pair of wolves across the valley. I was excited and quickly got out my binoculars. Sure enough, it was a wolf pair, and I forgot all about my tea watching them with a thrill. I'd helped collar some of the wolves in the area and had subsequently developed a great interest in their well-being, but I didn't recognize this pair. They were nonchalantly walking along the edge of the forest, heading for the river, probably on their way for a drink. Sure enough, they were soon at the water drinking. As I watched, I suddenly heard a strange noise coming from the forest downhill from me on my side of the river. It sounded like something big moaning in pain. The wolves stopped in their tracks and looked up at where the noise was coming from, paused for a brief moment, then skedaddled back into the forest they'd come from, not wasting any time, loping along and kind of looking over their shoulders. They soon disappeared into the thick timber. Well, this gave me pause because there's not much that a wolf is afraid of. In fact, I'm not sure there's anything except humans, and they didn't seem to be aware of me. Whatever had made that sound had scared them. I sat there, wondering what was going on. When I heard it again, it was definitely an animal in distress, and it sounded like something big. I wondered what was going on, my instincts telling me it was time to go home. I usually listen carefully to my instincts, especially after spending so much time in a wilderness that has plenty of apex predators. But for some reason, my curiosity overran my fears. After all, I was a wildlife biologist, and I was wondering what kind of animal would make a sound like that. I knew all the bears were in hibernation. Was there a wounded bison over there? That's about all I could figure could make such a deep moaning sound. I had never heard anything like it. I've seen wounded animals before, and I knew better than to get near them. But I guess my tranquilizer gun gave me a sort of false bravado. If there were a wounded animal nearby, my training said not to mess with it, to just let nature take its course. But my scientific curiosity got the better of me. I also carried a rifle, a .30-06, so if worse came to worse, I could shoot it and put it out of its misery. I hated to see anything suffer. I decided that I would carefully skirt over there and see what it was, be extra cautious, then head back to my truck. It couldn't be all that far over to where the sound had come from, and it was on my side of the river. I put my pack back on and felt like I was preparing for whatever it was. Well, I wasn't prepared at all, I found out. As I quietly skirted the trees, the moaning sounded out again, and it was truly heart-rending. It almost sounded human, and I stopped. What if it was a human? That would explain why the wolves had fled. In fact, that's about the only explanation I could come up with. But, a human could never make a sound that loud. It was a deep and distinct sound, something more like a bison or a large animal would make, and it almost shook the ground I was standing on. I was puzzled, but again continued. 
walking very quietly, I watched where I put my feet so as to not step on branches and alert it. The creature moaned again and again, each time giving me pause and making me want to flee, but also showing me where it was, like a directional beacon. Because I was going so slow, it took me quite a while to get to it. But when I did, I felt like someone must feel who discovers a new species. I had crept in behind some big rocks, and when I got the courage to peek around them, I was shocked beyond a word. There, lying on the ground on its side, as if it were too weak to fight any more, was a man-like being about the size of a human teenager, but covered from head to toe in slick reddish-brown hair. Its back was to me, but I could see it had something wrong with it. It was partially hidden behind some shrubs, so that I couldn't quite make out what was going on. Now the creature raised itself on its elbows and moaned again, the immensity of the sound taking my breath away. Whatever it was, it had one good pair of lungs. The sound was way louder than one would expect from something that size. Now it tried to scoot itself along on its hip, then stopped, obviously in pain, and somehow weighed down. Did it have a broken leg or something? If so, I would be obliged to shoot it. But how could I shoot something that seemed so human? I was pondering what to do more than trying to figure out what it was, which I did later. In fact, I became obsessed with trying to classify it. I tried to get a better vantage point, but I just couldn't see what was the matter. I stood there, hidden for some time, not sure what to do. I was thinking it was a monkey or a gorilla of some kind, but I had no idea why it would be in the wild near Yellowstone. Maybe it had escaped from some private zoo. You know how your mind tries to make sense of something it can't figure out? Something so foreign that it makes no sense to you. So you just keep mulling it over and over. I knew I had to do something and couldn't just stand there any longer. So I inched my way around to where I could see better. I was still behind it, but I could now see that its foot was caught in some kind of trap. It looked to be an old bear trap of some kind, and it looked all rusted out. The creature would try to pull off the trap with its big hand, then moan from the pain unsuccessful. I had no idea how long it had been there, but there was blood on its foot and all around it on the snow so I knew it had been trapped for some time, bleeding. I felt sick, thinking of the pain it must be in, as the huge jaw of the trap looked pretty well entrenched in the flesh of its foot. I knew there was no way I could help it without getting up close to it to spring the trap. I'd come across animals in traps before, but never in the park, as it was totally illegal to trap there. I'd always had someone with me to help, and we would generally either tranquilize and release it or shoot the animal if there was nothing we could do. I got out my tranquilizer gun. I would just have to tranquilize it and release it and let it go on its way to recovery or death, but that was all I could do. I put my gun to my shoulder and shot a dart into its back between the shoulder blades where it couldn't reach. The animal jumped, startled, I knew the darts had to sting a bit, but not too bad. It turned toward me, but couldn't move enough to look away. After a while, I knew I needed a second dart, so I reloaded and shot it again, then waited some more, trying to quit shaking. Now the animal was nodding its head down onto its chest, and I knew it was time to move in. I had no idea how long the effect would last on something this big, as the largest animal I'd ever tranquilized was a wolf. I very cautiously moved closer, picking up a long stick, then poking it a bit to see if it would react. It didn't, so I quickly went to the trap and was able to spring it, though it was difficult. The trap was old and rusted, and I guess it had been set many years ago. 
The poor creature had unwarily stepped into it. I pulled the big teeth of the trap away from the creature's flesh, which wasn't easy as it had dug deep. I didn't want to contribute to the damage, but I had to get it off. The foot was a mess, and I felt really bad for the animal. I had no idea if it could survive this, and even if it did, if it would be able to walk again and forage or hunt for food and water. I was again tempted to just shoot it and put it out of its misery, but it just seemed wrong. Keep in mind, I hadn't seen its face at this point, as I was too busy bringing the trap. I got up and back to where I'd left my pack by the rocks, getting out my first aid kit. It had only a few essentials in it, but one of those was a small bottle of iodine. All government field employees in my region had to take first aid courses, so I had an idea of what to do. I tried to clean out the wound a bit and then poured the whole bottle onto it, hoping it would help keep it from getting infected. I wondered if I should wrap it, but I decided the creature would just take it all off. Now, I had to get out of there as there was no more I could do, and who knew how long I had before the animal woke up. As I stood to go, I saw it move a bit. Its head had been resting on its left cheek, turned away from me, but now I saw that it had turned its head back and its eyes were open, watching me. I could now see its face, and I was stunned. It looked exactly like a human, but with a larger brow and a flat nose. And of course, it was much bigger. Its eyes were glazed with the sedative, but I knew it was awake enough to know what was going on. It watched me intently, and I immediately stepped back, then turned and ran like hell in sheer shock and fear as I realized what I was seeing. I had never seen anything like it, and I hoped I never would again. All I know is I picked up my gear and ran as fast as my legs would carry me on snowshoes until I had to slow down because my lungs were burning in pain. I was too scared to even look back, but I could imagine it at my heels, which in retrospect was unlikely given its condition. It was almost dark when I got back to my truck, threw my pack into the front seat and jumped in looking over my shoulder the whole time. I drove as fast as prudent back down the long and rough slick road. I took the next week off, saying I was ill. I couldn't sleep at night, and I kept thinking something was trying to break into my house. I would dream, strange, shadowy dreams of man-like beasts trying to get to me, large, dark monsters limping through my back pasture and coming to the house and trying to break in. Finally, after a week, my mind started calming down a bit, even though I was still in somewhat of a state of shock. I returned to work, but I told my boss I couldn't do any more wolf count for a while, as I was still too sick. I ended up taking several months of leave without pay, and spending time with my cousin at his place in Bozeman, Montana, recovering my balance. I had no idea such a creature existed, and I was too embarrassed to even talk about it to anyone, as I didn't want people to think I was going insane. Finally, I returned to work, and months later, I was taking a coffee break with a fellow employee who had been out in the field the previous week, doing the wolf work I had been assigned but couldn't do. She informed me she was going to ask for a transfer, because she wanted to go someplace warmer. This really shocked me, as I thought working with Wolf was one of her life dreams. I suspected something had happened. I flat out asked her if she had seen something. She looked at me, kind of funny, but refused to talk about it. I decided to tell her about my experience, and she listened intently. Finally, she started sobbing and shaking. I tried to reassure her. And it was then that she told me what she had seen, not more than a month after I'd seen it. Not far from where I'd taken off the trap, over on the other side of the valley, she'd been sitting in the trees, watching for wolves, and had instead seen a dark creature walk on two legs down to the river where it bent down and drank. It then stood 
looked directly her way and started towards her. She had panicked and was ready to run when it turned and walked the other way. She quickly retreated, running to her truck, just like I had done, scared to death. We talked about it for a while, both agreeing it had to be a Bigfoot, and sure enough, it had a limp, but seemed otherwise fine. I have no idea if it realized I'd saved its life and was thereby disposed favorably toward human, or if it also realized that a human had made that trap that almost cost it its life. I'll never know, but my coworker decided to stay, though neither of us will work in that area without someone else with us. We later found out that one of Yellowstone's most prominent backcountry rangers had seen the beast numerous times in the park and firmly believed in them, going on the record after he'd quit his job. So, I guess we're not nuts after all. On to the next one. Hello, I'm Bill, and I'm from Rochester, New York. While I was growing up, my best pal Cameron lived in a house on Lake Ontario. He had all sorts of kayaks, canoes, and paddle boards, making his property the perfect spot for summer shenanigans. It was early one afternoon when we got the scare of a lifetime. Several coves were close to Cameron's home, and we would usually pass them as we paddled out to a sandbar. One of them in particular always caught my attention. It was so dark compared to the others due to the conglomerate of overhanging trees. In a way, you could say it was like a cave that was out in the open. It always had this vibe like something was in there, watching us from afar, and was potentially dangerous. Cameron and I would even joke about it as we paddled past it. One day, we noticed a floating corpse while passing the area. At first, I couldn't tell what it was. It looks more like a pile of clothes stuck halfway onto the shore. There's hardly any crime where Cameron lived, so... I think that's why my brain rejected the idea that there could be a body floating in the water. The chances of us being first to discover a homicide seemed so incredibly slim. Cameron was the first to start paddling toward it. I suppose curiosity got the best of him. I, on the other hand, didn't feel it was wise to approach. Although I thought it was harmless, my instincts warned me to stay away. It was a gloomy day, making it even harder than usual to see. Dude, you gotta see this, Cameron said once he was about ten feet from the floating body. As I got closer, I could see how puffy the body was. I don't know if it was from water retention or some other gross bodily function, but it was extremely creepy looking. I didn't want to get any closer but I knew Cameron would give me crap if I refused. We were 12 years old at the time, and I think silly things like that mattered a lot more to you when you're around that age. I had to get within 10 feet of the corpse before I could tell it was a male. He was wearing a beige-covered vest, which appeared to have tackle hooked into it in various places. That led me to believe that this man was perhaps fishing when he died. I still couldn't wrap my head around the possibility of someone getting murdered in that area, so I was hesitant to look at it like that. But it was soon after we started poking the body with our paddles that a gigantic splash nearly caused me to fall out of my kayak. At first sight, it looked like a giant snake chomped down onto the corpse, which splashed droplets of both water and blood onto me and my vessel. Then, I noticed the head and long neck retracted into what appeared to be a large shell. That was when the creature began to look like a giant snapping turtle. This thing was guarding the corpse. There was no question in my mind that this animal was responsible for the man's death, although I didn't get to see the entirety of his body. I could tell that it was at least the size of a fully grown black bear, and it had to weigh at least as much. This creature was so dinosaur-like, 
I had never seen anything quite like it. It was scary enough to view from the kayak. I can't even begin to imagine how terrifying it would be if it had pulled up next to me while I was swimming. For some strange reason, Cameron started bashing it with his paddle. I suppose he thought it was too close and that it would soon come after him unless he scared it off. The multiple blows to the head seemed to have no effect. Its scales looked like armor. I noticed how well the animal blended in with the soil along the shore. I'm not exaggerating when I say it was a perfect match. That makes me wonder if the species can camouflage itself to any environment. Cam, stop, I shouted. Leave it alone. Let's get out of here. I was so worried that the large carnivore would lash out at us, but in one very swift motion, the creature went under the water with the dead guy in its jaws. I expected it to resurface somewhere nearby, but it never did. I've always wondered where it took its prey. We called the police after returning home, but we never received any news about anyone locating the body. It got to the point where it felt like everyone who knew us wondered if we might be fibbing. As I said, the idea of anyone getting attacked and killed in that area was unheard of. A body would have been required for people to believe it. But even then, I think it would have been so difficult for the local community to embrace the idea that a large, turtle-like creature was responsible. Hands down, that was the strangest experience of my life. As curious as I am to know more about that creature, I hope to never run into anything like that ever again. On to the next one. Hello everyone, my name is Pam, and I work at a veterinary office as an assistant for a couple of years. After graduating college, I didn't have a degree in the field, so I only did administrative work, but I got the job through my aunt, who used to work at the same office. I've never heard another true story quite like mine, which should help emphasize just how rare of a situation it was. It happened over eight years ago, and I'm still stunned by the whole thing. It's just so mysterious, I'm not going to disclose where my experience occurred, for I'm a bit worried that could somehow come back to bite me in the butt. I will, however, say that it happened in the northeastern section of the United States. It was raining when an older woman burst through the front door. She looked panicked. Her energy conveyed that time was of the essence. That alone was the most unusual thing because patients often look like nervous wrecks over injured or dying pets, but this was different. This woman appeared as though she had seen a ghost. It was nearly evening, so it had started getting dark outside. Every other staff member was busy at the time, so she insisted that I head out to help her carry in an animal that she found on the side of the road. It wasn't until I made it outside that I discovered the woman didn't have the animal with her. It was on the side of the street about half a mile away. I wasn't sure whether it was appropriate or acceptable, but I got into my vehicle and followed behind her pickup truck. Soon, we came across the site. It was on a very rural street, so there was a good chance that other drivers hadn't passed by the animal since the woman initially stepped into the office. I was expecting an average domesticated dog, but this was much different than anything else I had ever seen before. Before I even walked up to the body, I knew there was no way we would lift it into either of our vehicles by ourselves. We needed more brute strength. I used my cell phone to call the animal hospital and get a hold of my coworker Diego. He was a powerful guy so I thought he would be perfect for helping us with this endeavor. He arrived only a few minutes later, and I still had no better idea what this animal could be. The only theory that I had was it was in the wolf family. I was hoping that Diego would have more knowledgeable sense, but he appeared to be even more stumped than I was. 
He was so fascinated and wanted to get the body back to the facility for examination as soon as possible. Crazily, it took the three of us to lift the body onto the woman's pickup truck. We wanted to use her vehicle because she had a flatbed. Although the animal didn't appear to have any open gashes, we didn't want to place it inside my car or Diego's that didn't seem sanitary. Strangely enough, it wasn't until the massive body was atop the examination table that any of us noticed that the front legs weren't legs at all, but arms much like a human. The only reason we were even semi-comfortable around this thing was that it didn't have a pulse. If I thought it could wake up at any moment, there's no way I would have been anywhere near that place. The animal's mouth was closed, but yet you could still see how huge and sharp its teeth were. Judging by the size of those jaws, I wouldn't have been surprised if that mouth could penetrate steel. At long last, the head veterinarian was able to look over the body. That was when she spoke about how she once thought she saw a creature just like it not far from her house. I can't remember the exact number, but I knew she lived in the area for many years. I'm pretty sure she said it was only a few years earlier when she thought she saw an animal that resembled a wolf walking on two legs through a field near her home. But I guess she shook it off afterward because she decided it had to be a mere delusion. Seeing this creature on the examination table seemed to have a way of bringing back those initial thoughts when she saw it the first time. All of us at the facility were mystified about how to handle the situation. We couldn't decide if we should call the police, take blood tests, cut the creature open, snap some photos. It's interesting how when you find yourself in an insane situation like that, it's a lot harder than you'd imagine determining what to do. I think humans tend to believe that they did remain a lot more in control in those kind of crazy situations than they actually do. It's tough to act sensical when you're outright shocked. I have the utmost respect for those who can lead during difficult situations. Very few people possess that rare talent. Typically, we would have had the woman who brought the animal to our attention wait in the lobby, but it was like we were all too stunned to even remember to do something as simple as that. In any case, I just know she would have insisted on staying in there to observe the examination. She was a tough cookie, and I know she wanted to monitor the progress because she wanted to make sure she remained involved in the discovery. I'm not sure whether I would call her paranoid or wise for worrying that we might have done something with the body before she could show it to anyone else. I used to think that sort of notion sounded insane, but not anymore. There's no question that there are workers out there in various professions involved in cleaning stuff like that up. It's a way to ensure the public doesn't learn too much. I think those people know it's inevitable that only a few people will find out one way or another, but they merely want to minimize those numbers as much as possible. It's all about containment. When I consider all that, I don't blame that woman, she, even though she was a bit annoying at the time. I think that's just because the tension was higher than usual. While the head veterinarian used a small flashlight to examine the creature's eyes, it woke up and bit her arm. She screamed as she tore her arm away. It took a few seconds of struggling, but she succeeded in getting her arm back without losing it. However, she did lose a lot of blood in that brief moment. Frankly, I think the only reason she got her arm back was that the creature was in a weakened and disoriented state. This thing was so big that its jaws had to be stronger than any domesticated dog or wild wolf cousin. I've never seen muscles like that on anything else. I seriously thought I would have a heart attack as I watched this creature stand on two legs atop the operating table. It was like watching a demon rise from the pits of hell. The low growl seemed to shake my inside. 
I had never felt even close to as vulnerable as I did in that room. Of course, I wanted to bolt for the door, but I somehow just knew that I would be the first to go if I attempted that. I would have been the first to die. Even Diego, who I mentioned was a strong and capable man, appeared to be on the verge of wetting his pants. I so badly hoped he would pick up some heavy instrument and at least distract the animal enough to where everyone else could escape. However, he was panicked. I'm not sure how long we all stood in our positions along the wall, waiting to see who would be the first to get attacked, but the head veterinarian was the first to try to escape. Judging by how she was holding her arm, she probably thought she would lose too much blood if she waited any longer. She probably thought her death was inevitable if she didn't make a move soon. Unfortunately, her rushing toward the door on the opposite wall of where I stood attracted the creature's full attention. It hopped off the table in a monkey-like fashion and bit the veterinarian's left buttock. The woman fell onto the ground and the creature immediately went for the back of her neck. The sound of it sinking its teeth into the flesh below her head was awful. I'm so glad that I was able to stay composed enough to sneak out of the room while the animal had its way with her. Even Diego and the visiting woman made it out of there unharmed. Without saying a word, we rushed to Diego's vehicle and he drove us all the way out of there, right away. I got on my phone immediately and called the police, explaining that a large unidentified animal had awakened and attacked the head veterinarian. I handed the phone to Diego because I was crying way too hard, making it difficult for the woman on the other end of the call to understand. They asked us to drive to a safe place while they sent people to check out the scene. Nobody captured a dangerous wild animal, and none of the officers claimed to have seen anything of the sort. What's so crazy is that they ended up arresting a large nude man shortly after arriving at the clinic. Later that night, we saw him. He had dried blood all over his lips and on various other parts of his body. The guy looked like he had been busy eating a mound of raw meat. The officers informed us that they found him lying on the ground next to a body, consuming it like a total psychopath. When we saw the body of the head veterinarian, there was just barely enough left to identify her. There are no words to describe how disturbing of a revelation that was. It was freaky enough to learn that something like that bipedal beast exists in the first place. So, when it occurred to me that that animal might have once been human, that just made things so much more draw-dropping. I think we dealt with what is known as a skinwalker. I'm sure of it. What else could it have been? Now that I know they are real, I often wonder whether all skinwalkers are evil. When we saw the suspect in the back of the squad car, he just had the most sinister look in his eyes. It felt like they pierced into my soul. Nothing else compared to how miserable that energy was. I mean, how else would you be able to eat raw human flesh right off the bone? I think both being evil and being insane would have to be prerequisite to become a skinwalker in the first place. But who knows? That's just my guess. Maybe they're demons straight from the pits of hell and have never even known what it's like to be human. That awful night taught me that there's so much more to this world than meets the eye. Perhaps the worst part about that incident was that it never got announced to the nation or even the surrounding small community or even the surrounding small community. How are people supposed to protect themselves against this kind of evil if they don't know that it's out there in the first place? I think it's despicable that this sort of stuff rarely makes headlines, if ever. If I had the resources to do so, I would devote my life to exposing this stuff. I'd like to create a world where the government is forced to be honest. I know it's pessimistic to say so, but I doubt we will ever get to that point. I suppose the best we can do is look out for those we're close to.
I hope you enjoyed those encounters. And if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell, and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!